Wales, home of myths and legends, a place of tales of King Arthur. Wales is home to many stories and just as many historical figures, which we will explore. But to start off with, we need to understand what the country of Wales is and how it developed. So the word Wales itself comes from the Anglo-Saxons who called the native Britons or Brythonic, Walask and Walisk, meaning foreigner but the Welsh would originally have referred to themselves as Britons and spoke Brythonic. The word that would later evolve into Welsh now comes from the 7th century. Cumbrogi, the Brythonic word meaning fellow countryman or Cymru. From 78 AD, most of Britain was part of the Roman Empire. Parts of Wales would simply be part of Roman Britain, with various tribes now subjugated by Rome. It was towards the end of the Western Roman Empire that a transformation started to occur in Britain, as Rome had left Britain to its own fate sometime around the 5th century. But even before that, the garrisons of Britain had been depleted over the last 50 years or so. In 383, Magnus Maximus, or Maxon Ledig, as he's known in Welsh, took a good part of the garrison stationed in Britain for campaigns in Gaul and Spain in order to claim the imperial throne. Magnus was later killed by the forces of Emperor Theodosius in 388. The garrison in Roman Britain never returned to their full strength, and with a weakening grip, parts of Roman Britain changed either back to a more tribal style, with one strong man and his retinue controlling a small area, or Roman Britain simply keeping calm and carrying on with everyday life. But the sources of solid information is difficult to gather, as there is a lack of sources around the next few centuries, but we do have archaeological evidence. By the 5th century, Roman Britain began to transform. In the year of 407, Constantine III took the garrison from Roman Britain to Gaul and never returned. Coins featuring Constantine have only ever been found in the southeast of Britain. Wales was now facing attacks and raids from Ireland, but some Irish tribes began to settle in Wales, some in the northwest and others in the southwest. Constantine was killed in 411 and the Roman Emperor Honorius left the Britons to their own devices. What happened in Wales after this point is difficult to show a coherent timeline of events. The Monk Gildas is one of our primary sources for what happened in the now emerging Kingdom of Wales, but his account isn't in the style of a chronicler, and is more of an angry sermon at the kings in Britain. We know the Britons did fight off a raiding party in 411, but the details only mention the Britons defeating the raiders, no account of who led each party, or the casualties, or even the number of combatants. The Greek historian Zorsimus mentions this raid, and Gildas states that the Britons took up arms. Later legends tell of a former emperor's son leading the forces called Owain. There is a traditional view for the end of Roman rule in Britain, with the ending in 410. But as mentioned, parts of Wales could have already changed to small tribal states or Roman Britain communities, or even new ones from Ireland before 410. Archaeological evidence of large amounts of coins and silverware dating before 410 could imply that some rich Roman Britons felt the need to hide such treasures as the situation in Roman Britain was unstable or even dangerous in some parts. We know raiding was common in coastal parts either from the Irish or Picts, but in places far from the coastline, the situation could be very different for the people there. But it's not like the Romans in Britain suddenly packed up everything and left on vast amounts of ships into Gaul or Roman Spain, even if the message from the Emperor was, look after yourselves from now on. But without Roman rule, the people of Britain had to look locally for leadership, and that is where some of the historical figures we will come across may have arisen from. The early Middle Ages are also referred to sometimes as the Dark Ages, but there was no fall back to a barbarian way of life, it was more of a transformation into something else. As trade still continued, although not on such a large scale as before, we know this because Irish craft goods have been found in Dinis Powys and Dinis Embris, 
glass and pottery which came from Athens and Gaul, and even a Byzantine intaglio. Agricultural work scaled down to a more local level, as there was not such a massive beast such as the Roman army to feed now. The period of 400 to 600 AD is incredibly important to the development of the Welsh kingdoms. However, it's important to state that again, there is no clear timeline of this period, only one's interpretations and debates on what happened, as each part of what would become the Welsh kingdoms were different in how Romanized or Celtic they were. One of our sources, the Early Medieval Wales, a framework for archaeological research, states, there is little convincing evidence for the continued use of Roman, urban or military sites, including those which remained in occupation during the 4th century. We can look at this in three ways. Firstly, the abandonment of urban Roman structures, like villas in the southwest of Wales, could again be due to rich Romans leaving Britain for safer parts of the empire. This would have been supported by the catches of coins found. Secondly, because of the collapsing economy, there may not have been the funds or the material to maintain such infrastructure, as the coinage was now obsolete in Britain, and a return for trading for goods commenced. With these changes happening, the new emerging Welsh kingdoms would have formed around these changes, and thirdly, some Welsh hill forts were later used as foundation for Anglo-Norman castles, so these sites may have been repopulated at the start of the 5th century. Wales in the early Middle Ages had many kingdoms. We don't know much about the earliest kingdoms, but some do have at least a shared history with some Roman emperors, and others with the Irish. The Kingdom of Dovid is one example. The area in which the kingdom was formed was inhabited before the Roman conquest by a tribe called the Demeti. But during the Roman occupation, the area was a target for raids by the Irish, and by the 4th century, the land would be settled or suffer incursions by an Irish tribe, called the Desi, who were driven out of Ireland. The story is from a medieval Irish tale called The Expulsion of the Desi, and tells this tale. Orchide, son of Archop, with his descendants, went over the sea into the land of Dovid, and his sons and grandsons died there, and from them descended the race of Crintham over there. The Historia Bretonium mentions them settling in West Wales, and Welsh genealogies from the royal line of Dovid lists Irish names, but they also list Roman names later on, so there are two origin stories on this kingdom, one where the Irish tribe settled, and one with a Roman origin dating back further than the arrival of the Irish tribe, perhaps for more of a pedigree Roman connection, to enable the Welsh kings in Dufford to claim to be the truest rulers of the kingdom and the most legitimate, but it's hard to prove and can sometimes only matter to a king with a firm grasp of power in the kingdom, who is also looking further to cement his authority and claiming to be a pedigree of Roman rulers is good propaganda. But there are several inscribed stones in the southwest of Wales dated in the 5th century and beyond. Some have been inscribed in Latin, while some have been in Irish Ogham, which is an early Middle Ages alphabet. Magnus Maximus appears as the connection for the King of Dufford to claim lineage to Rome, but the evidence points to a more Irish connection. Gwynedd was home to the native tribe of the Ordoviciths and the Deciangli. After the Roman conquest, the area was more of a military hub than a civil settlement, meaning the people in the area didn't become as Romanized as South Wales, but like Dovid, parts of the area were settled by the Irish around the late Roman period, and there were also inscribed memorial stones with Irish names on them dated around the 6th century, but compared to Dovid, the Irish settlements were smaller. The Historia Bretonium tells of the legend of how Gwyneth came to be, and of the ancestors of Mylgwyn Gwyneth. Canada, with his sons who numbered eight, had come formerly from the northern parts that is the region called Manai of Gododin. 146 years before Malguin ruled, they expelled the Irish with very great destruction from these regions, so that they never came back again to live there. 
But as we know, the Irish were not driven out, as stones inscribed in the 5th century contest this story. There is evidence of a settlement in Clean. The sons of Canada may have named the territories in Gwynedd, or the territories were named after the sons. However, the story of how the Kingdom of Gwynedd formed supports the theory of a Brythonic warlord settling in the area and forming the kingdom, as archaeological evidence has found burial sites and forts similar to ones in the north of Britain, especially in the Fife area, offering a theory that a warlord from that area came and conquered the now Kingdom of Gwynedd around the 5th century. The Kingdom of Powys in one of our sources, The History of Wales, by John Davis, he describes the name. Powys probably comes from the word Pagus, both therefore are cognate with the word Pagan. It is believed that the nucleus of the Kingdom of Powys was the Pagnus or the hinterland of the territory of the Corvorni, and that Powys expanded to include not only the territory, the rich land of the Middle Severn Valley, but also the lands between the upper reaches of the River Wynn and Dee. The traditional story of how Powys formed was that Vortigern was the founder of the dynasty of Gethornian. But another tale tells us he married a woman called Severa, who was the daughter of Roman Emperor Magnus Maximus, giving another connection to Rome. But we will cover the problematic name of Vortigern in another episode. There isn't much evidence telling us about the early kingdom. We know it was heavily Romanized, with plenty of Roman settlements still in use after Rome's withdrawal. Venter Salurum Coent, and even as far as Vericonium, in the now county of Shropshire. The Kingdom of Gwent. We have little information on how the Kingdom of Gwent formed after the Roman withdrawal. Our sources for the early kings of Gwent only list names and no other details. The Book of Clandaf, a 12th century source, only states names as well. The Kingdom of Glewissing. Magnus Maximus once again appears in the creation of this kingdom, Taudwig claims descendant from Magnus, but more information is scarce as some of the smaller petty Welsh kingdoms are mixed or were ruled over by other kingdoms and later formed new ones. The rest of the kingdoms did have their own kings, but again their only names and no other information, and some are twisted into legends with no historical context, only names and as the kingdoms rose, they would be conquered by stronger rivals or subjugated by them, as several Welsh figures would rise to become major figures in Welsh history, and we will explore them in the next episodes.